Good morning, church. What a gift it is to have you here on this Sunday, May 2nd, 2021. We continue our journey this morning in a faith that has impact. It is intentional, missional, personal, affirmational, connectional, and transformational. This morning, we will deal with what it means to have a faith that is personal. It's actually about you. It's actually about me. It's actually about the real lives and the real spirits we carry in this world. Towards that end, please know each of you, just as you are, is welcome to this space. And as we gather, I want to make you aware of a couple of things happening in the life of this community that are important for you to be able to consider being a part of. The first of those is if you are on the email or mailing list here, you have received a survey about your intentions and desires and expectations regarding reopening the sanctuary for public worship in some form. It is most helpful to have your input and information in all ways that you choose to express it, but in particular, in that survey. Please fill it out and please get it back to the office. Please get it back to us and know that we as a staff and a leadership team and a session will be making choices very much based upon your input as we target reopening in some way to gather back in the sanctuary for worship. That deadline for that survey is May 4th, but you can certainly turn it in earlier. It's wonderful if you do. Thank you for that also want to just invite you to two opportunities to be in service in this particular place and also one of the ministries and missions of this place. On the 8th, so that will be next Saturday, there is the church cleanup day. Folks are welcome to come and sign up and be a part of sort of helping the grounds and some pieces inside be dressed up and ready for the days in which we reopen this space. And the following Saturday, the 15th, Camp Whitman Volunteer Day is happening. I will be leading a group towards that end. That will be from 9.30 until 1 o'clock on that Saturday. We will meet here at the church. Uh, let us know that you are interested, and we will contact you around details for carpooling and such like that. And we will go have a chance to help camp become what it can be for those who will use it for their summer blessing. What a joy to have you here. Friends, as we gather in this space, take note of what you need to take note of and then release that which will hold you back. Know that you are welcome in this space. God is here and so are you. And may the peace of Christ be with you all. Through the generosity of church world service partner organizations, congregations, and individual supporters, our most vulnerable neighbors around the world can feel safe and keep warm with fresh linens and clean sleeping quarters. When our neighbors are in need, even a $10 blanket means that someone cares. Blankets are used in homeless shelters. They are wrapped around refugees and upheaval from their homes. They comfort people who have experienced a disaster. They give warmth to people who receive them at food banks. These are more than blankets. They are an act of love as Jesus commanded the disciples in Matthew 25, verses 34 to 46.
Friends, many of you know that I have been a church coach and assessor for the denomination, and I have been privileged to have access to many, many churches all around the country, and the ways in which they speak of themselves and their hopes and their desires and how it is they present themselves in the world. And here's one thing that is almost ubiquitous in church culture. Every church I have ever assessed or been connected to says, all are welcome. Most of them put it on a sign. And if you ever see a sign in front of a church that says, you're not welcome, I invite you to not go there. But all are welcome has become so general. All are welcome becomes a nicety without particularity. And as we gather this morning in our call to worship, I want to remind you that all are welcome, and that means you. That means you specifically. With your questions, you are welcome. With your joy, you are welcome. With your pain, you are welcome. With your history, you are welcome. With your hoped for future, you are welcome. With the reality of who you are, what you've done, where you come from, what you know, and what you don't, you are welcome. It is not a general slogan, it is a particular invitation. This morning, friends, know that all are welcome, and that means you. Sorrows like sea. 
Well, good morning, young people. Have you ever played hide and seek? Hide and seek is kind of a fun game when everybody knows what they're actually trying to do. You know, hide and seek where someone is it and then everybody else spreads out and tries to find a good hiding place. And then whoever is it comes and looks for you and tries to make sure that you get found. Now, sometimes people hide better than others. Sometimes people do a really good job. Most of the time, we get found. And that's actually part of what makes it fun. To know that somebody is looking for us. And no matter how hard we try to hide, we still can be found. Can you imagine hide and seek if the person who was it stopped playing? If the person who was supposed to look for you just did not? Then it would be hide and be lonely. Then it would be hide and be lost. And nobody wants to play that game. Sometimes we find better ways to hide and not tell everything about our lives, or there are things we don't want everybody to know. And sometimes we do a pretty good job, sometimes not so much. Sometimes Everybody knows we're trying to hide, but they can still see us. Now this morning, we're going to talk about Zacchaeus, the story of Zacchaeus in the Bible. Zacchaeus was a man who had some stuff that he probably should have wanted to hide from others. People didn't like him very much. He had a job that was hard. He wasn't quite sure where he was in terms of going to temple and being in his faith community. But Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was in town and there was a big parade and a whole group of people. And Zacchaeus made a decision that he was not going to play hide and seek anymore with God. Zacchaeus was making sure that he could see Jesus. And so this professional older man climbed a tree. It actually says in the Bible that he climbed a tree so that he could see Jesus and so that Jesus could see him. He wasn't playing hide and seek anymore. He was playing here I am. Might I be found? And Jesus saw him. He called him by name. He said, I see you. I found you. I'm it, and I know where you are. Come on down from the tree, Zacchaeus. Today I will be in your house. And that day was the beginning of a new life for Zacchaeus. He knew that God was it, and through Jesus was trying to find him. And he did find him, and his life changed. And it was good. I hope you know this morning that no matter what ways you try to hide, you will always be found. God is it. You are loved. And the Holy One is looking for you. It's better that way. And thanks be to God. There's a fairly famous scripture which talks about a speck and a log. The speck is in your neighbor's eye and the log is in your own. As we enter into a time of confession this morning, I invite you to think a little bit about why confession is helpful and healing not shaming or condemning, but actually helpful and healing. 
Because when we find ourselves in the condemnation of the other while taking no honest assessment of ourselves, we are not well-grounded, we are not well-founded, and we are probably not accurate in our assessment. Jesus says, why do you look at the speck in your neighbor's eye while ignoring the log in your own? First take out the log from your own eye then you can help. Confession is an opportunity to do that, to be honest and healthy and holy and healed ourselves so that then as we present ourselves and view and assess the rest of the world, we can do it with compassion, accuracy, and kindness. And so as we gather for confession this morning, I invite you to recognize the things that you so often find distressing, disturbing, and troubling in other people's lives may also be present in your own. Clear up the things that are present in your own so that you can heal and love your neighbor. And to give you a little visual for this, have you ever been to the eye doctor? I have, and here's what I know. There's a moment where you have to tilt your head up and back. You have to open your eyes and allow the doctor to put drops in your eyeballs. It's pretty uncomfortable. And after that is done, the assessment has been made, a prescription can be given and you see better. And so this morning in confession, I invite us all to look up, to open up, and to trust that the great physician of our brokenness calls us to clear-sightedness. Each of us has fallen short of the glory of God. Each of us has the possibility of new and clear vision. Each of us is loved enough for that work to be done, and each of us is a forgiven soul of Christ Jesus who can see clearly in the world that which must be healed and the way to help do so. Friends, know this day you are forgiven. The first reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 13 through 18. I'm reading from the King James Version. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some, Elias, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, the 19th chapter, the first through the ninth verses, this taken from the message translation. Then Jesus entered and walked through Jericho. There was a man there, his name Zacchaeus, the head taxman and quite rich. He wanted desperately to see Jesus, but the crowd was in his way. He was a short man 
and couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran on ahead and climbed up in a sycamore tree so he could see Jesus when he came by. When Jesus got to the tree, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry down. Today is my day to be a guest in your home. Zacchaeus scrambled out of the tree, hardly believing his good luck, delighted to take Jesus home with him. Everyone who saw the incident was indignant and grumped. What business does he have getting cozy with this crook? Zacchaeus just stood there, a little stunned. He stammered apologetically, Master, I give away half my income to the poor, and if I'm caught cheating, I pay four times the damages. Jesus said, today is salvation day in this home. Here he is, Zacchaeus, son of Abraham. The third reading is taken from the Gospel of John, the fifth chapter beginning at the second verse, reading from the English Standard Version. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man who who had been there an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I am going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed, and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So this morning, we will talk about what it means to have a faith that is personal. A faith that really is about you, really is about me. Not just an idea or a theory or a concept, but the real deal, really, in a real life. This sermon will be a little bit of a different format than you've heard from me before. Thank you for coming along. What follows the end of the speaking will be some singing, and the singing will be a song I wrote called One of Mine. Every verse is a real story of a real person who I really encountered, and the ways in which a personal, real faith mattered to them. Now, I will tell you, for purposes of the song and rhyme scheme and also to protect sort of the nature and identity of some of the folks whose stories will be told. Some of the details and the identifying particularities have been adjusted. I would ask you not to spend much time trying to identify who it might be. Instead, to spend the time wondering what it means. So I'm about to tell you true stories of the power of faith in particular people's lives. I'm going to lift up the necessity of a faith that is personal and celebrate a number of occasions where the personal experience and powerful presence has in fact saved someone. It can happen. It does happen. And I know 
I know and you know that there are so many stories of people who do not have beautiful stories of salvation. Good people struggling and trying to believe who did not make it through or have not overcome in this life. So let me be clear. I am not promising health, wealth, immunity, unshakable certainty, prosperity, or elite power if only you are faithful enough. That false gospel has brought more suffering to God's children not less. If only you were faithful enough, your cancer would be cured, some people might say. That is cruelty in the name of Christ. Oh, God promises to multiply your financial seeds of faith into an immeasurably abundant harvest for those he loves. So if you lost your job in the midst of economic turmoil and a pandemic, well, then obviously God does not love you. That is cruelty in the name of Christ. I could go on and on, but let me leave it at this. There has never been one more faithful than Jesus himself. And he struggled and had struggles beyond imagining in his worldly life. Faithfulness does not remove us from the storm, but it can shine a light to help us walk through it. Faith does not remove us from the storm, but it can shine a light to help us walk through it. It can happen. It does happen. The faith that changes us is personal. Verse 1. Three days is how long they'll hold you in hopes that you make it through the night. You said it was over and wrote out a plan and then you gave it a try. You just want the pain to end and the burden you think you are. So much is broken, but this much is right. You are one of mine. I got a call from her parents. Would I be willing to go to the emergency psych unit because their teenage daughter had made a credible threat to her own life and was taken into an emergency space so that at least she could be safe? And I gathered with them and was given permission, because I'm clergy, to be in a lockdown unit with a beautiful, talented, lovely young daughter of God who didn't know that she was any of those things and was broken in her spirit profoundly and deeply. And her parents have been telling her how great she was her entire life. And in that moment, it didn't matter. Counselors had been telling her for years some strategies to overcome the pieces in her spirit which were dark and hard, and in that moment, it didn't matter. What did matter, eventually, What began to sink in for a moment was this. God does not make mistakes. You are not a mistake. God does not make junk. You are not worthless. You are a child of God, not just the child of well-meaning parents who have loved you well but imperfectly because they are just people. She made it out. She's still 
struggling to fully accept what that might mean. The part of what lifted her from the very edge of the abyss was a personal faith that she was made and loved and wanted by God. The conceptual, the theoretical, the theological, and the doctrinal did not pull her back from the edge. God did. It was personal. Verse 2. In the needle is the only piece you can find as you run away from the war. The battle remains, but the uniform is gone, brother in arms no more. Cold and alone, no place to call home, the free ones pay you no mind. In all of this darkness, please seek the light. You are one of mine. He loved his country. (laughs) He was proud of his service. He was a good man who had been through some real hard stuff. And addiction got a hold of him. It took over him. The overwhelming presence of not being in control and the need for escape artificially became a dominant need in his life beyond relationship, self-care, or self-worth. And he got connected to the 12 steps of addiction recovery. He had tried and tried and tried on his own, and he could not pull it off on his own. He had been to treatment voluntarily and involuntarily, and it didn't keep. He could not, under his own power or under the best instruction and guidance and care in the world, overcome this dark and hard thing. He is now sober. He is sober because he believes he's worthy of being sober. And he is sober because he followed 12 steps that include a faith that is personal. If you don't know all 12 steps, I'm not going to share them all this morning, but there's a few I will reference. Number one, we admit we are powerless. Hmm. And our lives have become unmanageable. Step one, humility, not humiliation, but humility. We admit we are powerless. There are some things beyond what we can do ourselves. Step two, we've come to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. Come to believe that a power greater than us can restore us. That's about as personal as it gets, my friends. Not, we've come to believe that the idea of being a lovely person under the auspice of a benevolent, benevolent divine is a worthy thing to pursue. No. We've come to believe that power greater than ourselves. I have come to believe, he said, greater than myself is a power that can restore me. And I can tell you, he's a recovering addict every day and will be identified as such every day for the rest of his life, but he is sober because of a power that is greater than him, something that can empower and enlighten him in the hard moments where literally no wisdom of this world could. No, the conceptual, the theoretical, the theological, and the doctrinal did not make him sober. God did. And it was personal. 
verse 3. You spoke your promise, but broke your vow, then tried to cover your shame. Things are different, but still right now we choose each other's name. Till death do us part, the simple and hard, the rough places and the fine. With all we've been through, still, I do. You are one of mine. Their marriage was on the brink. Someone was, as we know another story in scripture, caught in adultery. There's no way around it. It happened. It was bad. It was sinful. It was wrong. And sometimes, oftentimes, many times, that's it. That's the end. The end of the covenant, the end of the relationship, the end of being willing to try and try again. And sometimes in full context, there may be no other choice. And please hear that I am never, ever, ever going to invite anyone to remain in an abusive situation or anyone to harm themselves for the remainder of a lifetime in something that is broken beyond worldly repair. That being said, There are times, there are moments where the faith that is personal redefines how we can forgive ourselves and one another. For you see, in the face of this brokenness, each of the partners had made a promise to love the other not just as their domestic partner, not just as someone who owed them as a spouse, but they had made a covenant and a promise to care for one another as if the other was a very child of God. In the foolishness, the brokenness, the incompleteness that will attend every human life, they had made that promise. And they kept that promise. Not because they wanted to. Not because it was easy. Not because the world said, well, that's really what you should do. But because at the end of the day, what God had brought together, even this would not tear us under. The conceptual, the theological, The theoretical and the doctrinal did not do this. God did. It was personal. Verse 4. You told the same story five minutes ago. I know you don't remember. Each day further away until you find forever. I'll remember your name and your dignity when you search but cannot find. I'll sit with you in the truth of this place. You are one of mine. This extraordinary man, father of many, successful in the world, really smart, really capable, really in charge almost all the time. Got sick. Got really sick. Began to lose his capacity and control of the world. Couldn't remember all the things that he wanted everybody else to remember. Dementia began to take hold of this extraordinary mind, this wonderful man. 
And it was hard. It was so hard for those who loved him and knew him. Because what do you do when the person who's in control no longer has the power to make sense? The journey took a little while, and there was a lot of tear and a lot of frustration and a lot of sorrow. And there were some moments for him where he was aware of what he was unaware of, and it caused some real anger, (laughs) some real loss, some real fear. And then I was invited to gather with the family for the last hour of his life. And he wasn't saying anything that made any kind of sense. Till we prayed. And we could see his lips moving at the end of the Lord's Prayer. Somewhere beyond all of the loss and the chaos and the shrinking brain. There was a faith that was personal and embedded in his soul that could speak even in that his final hour. And as I held his hand, and we sang Amazing Grace, he died. He died in peace. He died okay. He died happy. The conceptual, the theoretical, the theological, the doctrinal did not do this. God did. It was personal. In verse 5, rarely understood, often betrayed a king with a crown of thorns, born of Mary, amazing grace, whose love was met with scorn. After the cross came the garden, a savior, oh, so kind, go tell the others what you have seen. You are one of mine. When we talk about the incarnation, when we talk about Jesus the Christ, when we talk about the sacrifice of the cross and the miracle of the stone rolled away, we are talking about a God who so loves you that it was worth it. We're not talking about an idea. We're not talking about a concept. We're not talking about a chosen theory of how to live a worldly life. We are talking about a God who so loves you that this was worth it. God so loves the world and everyone in it that the child on the brink of despair can find life again. God so loves the world and everyone in it that the man overwhelmed by the evil presence of addiction has found a power beyond himself to know new life. God so loves the world and everyone in it that those who have gone down the roads that they wish they didn't go down have a chance at renewal and sometimes a chance to save a relationship. God so loves the world that even those who are being lost to the world can hear the mysterious grace of the holy in the darkest moments and the beautiful transition from this life into the next. God so loves the world and everyone in it. And hear me this morning, that means you. that we have an opportunity to hold that truth in our spirits, to walk with our Christ in our lives, and know that at the end of the day, it is personal. 
And for that we say, thanks be to God. Three days is how long they'll hold you In hopes that you make it through the night They said it was over and wrote out a plan Then you gave it a try You just want the pain to end And the burden you think you so much is broken, but this much is right. You are one of mine. In the needle is the only peace you can find as you run away from the battle remains but the uniform's gone brother in arms no more cold and alone no place to call home the free ones pay you no mind in all of this darkness please seek the light you are one of mine. You are one of mine. You spoke you promise, but broke your vow. I tried to cover your shame. Things are different, but still right now, we choose each other's name. Till death do us part, the simple and hard, rough places and the fine. And all we've been through, still I do. You are one of mine. You told the same story five minutes ago. I know you don't remember. Each day further away Until you find forever I'll remember your name and your dignity When you search but cannot find I'll sit with you in the truth of this place you are one of mine. You are one of
amazing grace His love was met with scorn After the cross came the garden Savior, oh, so kind Go tell the others what you have seen You are one of mine You are one of mine I trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies me by grace through faith, sets me free to accept myself and to love God and neighbor, and binds me together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules my faith and life in Christ through Scripture engages me through the word proclaim, claims me in the waters of baptism, feeds me with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls me to all ministries of the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives me courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among the peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of people long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the spirits, I strive to serve Christ in my daily tasks to live a holy and joyful life, even as I watch for God's new earth and heaven, praying, come Lord Jesus. This morning, I wanna invite you to be a people in prayer and I want to invite you to do that in a way that may in fact be unfamiliar or uncomfortable. I will tell you that most of the time when folks are asked to pray, they find a way to do so intentionally and well and with a certain measure of distance. We're meaning we Presbyterians. Sometimes, oftentimes, pray for big ideas. And those big ideas are important and they are godly founded. We pray for justice and freedom and peace. We pray for holiness and hopefulness. We pray for the vulnerable and the other and the refugee. And those are all good and real and true, and sometimes we forget to pray just for ourselves, for the people closest to us, for the things that make a tear come to the eye, that offer a stutter in our speech, that break our hearts a little bit. Those are the prayers I want to invite you into this morning. I won't name them because I don't know them. But we will hold a space of silence where you can be in prayer for those things that break your heart, for those people you love and struggle with, for the truth of your life and your fear and your faith. Please know those prayers are honest, they count. And in those broken spaces, the light of hope might shine. And so this morning, let us pray.
most holy and compassionate God. Father and mother of us all, Savior and Christ of us all, spirit and inspiration and hope for us all. We pray this morning for that which is real and true, joyful and hard. Hold us, help us, heal us, we pray. As together we lift up the words that your child taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
So church, as you go out from this place, may you go out with joy. May the trees of the fields clap their hands. May peace like a river attend your soul. May you know that you are loved, you are chosen, and you are here. Go forth into the world in the sure and certain confidence of being accompanied by your Christ. Live in such a way that the world shines a little bit. As you go, go in peace to love and serve the Lord.